Graduate Entry Medicine at the University of Oxford, an intense four-year medical program at one of the best and most prestigious universities in the world. In 2019, 373 people applied for Graduate Entry Medicine at the University of Oxford. They shortlisted 80 people for an interview and gave out 36 offers. That translates to a competition ratio of about 1 in 12 from application to offer. My name is Marius Hugh, I'm a final year graduate entry medical student at Southampton and in this series of videos we try to combine a plethora of resources to bring you evidence-based tips for your graduate entry medicine applications. So to start with let's talk about how the graduate medicine course at Oxford is set up. So for the four-year program at Oxford University you do two years of a bespoke course before you're siphoned back in with the under grads. This basically means that your first two years you're only with the graduates, the 30 or so graduates that enrol on the course at Oxford and then in your third year you're reintroduced back into the normal cohort in its fifth year because Oxford undergraduate medicine is actually a six-year course, it's a mandatory intercalation year. Because I like pictures here's a schematic to demonstrate what I'm going on about. As you can see the standard program is six years long because I think yeah as I said you have to intercalate and here you can see the two-year bespoke pathway for the grads before you rejoin. So yeah this is similar to a lot of other places. Southampton, my own very good medical school actually do this as well. Other places like St George's do this and this differs from the setup of other graduate entry medical schools like Newcastle who do uh, a really big first year and then you're reintroduced in the standard year three or for example Warwick that do a four-year bespoke program for the grads that they don't have any undergrads in that course so really you're just living your best life with the graduate entry mandem. So for the first two years at Oxford University on this graduate program it sounds very pre clinical whereas other courses you you mix in preclinical learning with actually early clinical contact it sounds like at Oxford they just want you to learn your you know your basic sciences uh, your physiology your anatomy your, your basic pharmacology like for example how aspirin works um, as a cox1 inhibitor and stops the conversion of arachidonic acid to uh, thromboxane a2 which in turn stops the activation of nascent thrombocytes but yeah that's the kind of stuff you'll probably be learning Anyway, it sounds like you also do clinical skills teaching, so um, that will be learning how to take a patient history uh, and to do a, a basic examination of a patient um, and probably other, some other things like cannulation, uh, venipuncture, etc. After these two pre-clinical years are done, you'll progress to your clinical years. Um, that's the thing I've been doing for the last two years, um, where you literally just follow around groups of doctors in different specialties and you try to learn the practice of medicine in more of an apprenticeship type environment. So what set of qualifications are you going to need to apply for the course? So unlike other graduate medicine courses, Oxford actually asks for specific A-levels. So if you haven't achieved at least A, A, B in your A-levels and taken chemistry alongside maths, physics or biology, then you're probably not going to qualify for Oxford graduate medicine. So personally, I didn't apply to Oxford graduate medicine because I did maths, physics and biology as my A-levels. Uh, although I got three A-stars, I still wouldn't have qualified uh, because I didn't have that chemistry A-level. Considering also the fact that there were other places I could apply to do graduate medicine um, without having to do any extra work. So yeah, just to reiterate that point, there's lots of other graduate medicine courses you can apply to without any specific A-levels, for example, Southampton and Warwick. So in terms of how this actually translates into statistics held by people that were successful at getting into Oxford graduate medicine, I think as a general rule, you should always try to corroborate what you're reading on the entry requirements uh, tabs of these websites with concrete statistical data from freedom of information requests. The J Levy request from 2019 tried to do just this. They tried to shine a light on the lowest A-level grades for a candidate that successfully made it onto the course in 2019. However, unfortunately, this was actually refused by Oxford University, and this was on the grounds that it would actually take too long for them to work out. Somehow they calculated that looking through 30 applications for the lowest A-level grades was going to take them more than 18 hours. Anyway, in the absence of any statistical evidence, we must just trust what they say on the website. And this pretty much reveals uh, what I've already said, but also the fact that if you've got a biochemistry degree, uh, you don't have to take chemistry A-level. So what about the undergraduate degree requirements for Oxford Graduate Entry Medicine? So they say the course is only open to graduates with a degree class of a 2-1 or above or a GPA above 3.5. And this has to be in a applied experimental science. So let's first address the statement that you need a 2-1 in order to qualify. If you know me and you've watched my stuff before and you've smashed that like and subscribe button, um, then you'll know that I like to err on the side of pessimism when it comes to these statements. 
and I do like to corroborate, I've already said it in this video, but I like to corroborate these statements with literal statistical evidence from freedom of information requests. So what we have to do is we go on to www.whatdotheyknow.com. If you're new to the graduate medicine scene, this is a website that you're gonna become very familiar with over the next few months. What you have to do is search up Oxford A101, that's the course code for Oxford Graduate Medicine. And what you do is you trawl through these requests looking for successful ones. And what you wanna try and do is look for the most recent successful application uh, that covers the question that you're trying to ask. So when I was doing this, I found one from 2019 from Jay Levy. In this request, the first thing they asked is, of all the offer holders in 2019, how many had bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and D fills. So they'd probably heard on the grapevine that the only people who get into graduate medicine at Oxford have PhDs. So he was submitting a freedom of information request to actually examine this point. So what he found was that of the 76 people that got an interview in 2019, 36 had bachelor's degrees, 32 had masters, and eight had D fills, so PhDs. So I think this is potentially quite significant because actually no one has a PhD on my course, but yeah, very few have master's level degrees. I'd say probably less than five. Whereas at Oxford in 2019, of all the people that were shortlisted for interview, uh, over half of them had either a master's or a DPhil. And this I reckon is probably reflective of the academic nature of the course at Oxford. Um, the fact that they probably want people with uh, proven research prowess and, and academic prowess. People that are going to want to be interested in um, the experimental research side of, of practicing medicine. Another bit of key information that we can garner from this request is in relation to bachelor's degree holders. Because Jay Levy doing God's work revealed that of the people who had a bachelor's, 16 of them have firsts and nine had two ones no one had a 2-2. So this is revealing and reassuring because it suggests that Oxford graduate medicine um, don't bias people that have got first compared to people that have got two ones. Like certain other universities that say you need a minimum of a 2-1, but actually when you look at the credentials of people that have got in, everyone's got firsts. Let's now move on to the other thing they say about the undergraduate degree requirements for Oxford graduate medicine. And that's this thing about your undergraduate degree needing to have been in an applied experimental science. So what does this actually mean well Oxford provide an official list of subjects that come under the umbrella uh, of an applied experimental science and these are things like pathology zoology biology yeah they're all sciencey ish subjects um, but they're not specifically bioscience subjects like for example you need at King's College London corroborating this with the actual statistical data from freedom of information requests like I'd encourage you to do when I stop making these videos we can find a request from 2021 from someone called Hannah Benz and this actually agrees with what they say on on the official website, the only slight discrepancy is the fact that uh, candidate 25 actually has a first in economics, um, which as far as I know is not a, a subject that's on these lists of applied experimental sciences. So once again, this shows the potential value in consulting these freedom of information requests before you you know, get disheartened by the fact that you might not get into somewhere because you haven't got the right degree type or the de right degree class. If you're watching this and you're applying to medical schools that I haven't made videos on, I implore you to look at these statistics to look at you know freedom of information requests on that website what do they know.com uh, and just work out exactly what credentials people have got that are successful in getting into these places because in the UK you may only direct your applications to four schools in an academic cycle so that's four medical schools per year and you need to target the places where the credentials you already hold in your application are going to give you the best chance of actually winning an interview. Once you get to interview the likelihood or of your success is going to dramatically increase but you just need to target schools where your credentials will get you to that interview. Anyway here is a personal anecdote from the student room from someone who reportedly got into graduate entry medicine at Oxford. So it sounds like this person had a neuroscience degree from Bristol. And yeah, she reports the fact that there's a lot of people in her year with bachelor's degrees. Not everyone has, has PhDs or whatever. So the Hannah Benz request also revealed a couple of random things about the enrolling cohort at Oxford. They found that of the 38 people that enrolled on graduate entry medicine at Oxford in 2020, 18 were males and uh, 20 were females. The request also revealed that the youngest in the cohort was 21 and the oldest was 33. So if you are considering doing graduate medicine and you're in your late 20s or early 30s or even beyond, um, just know that other people are doing it. There's people enrolling 
at Oxford University on graduate medicine at the age, at the tender age of 33 years old. So we've established that you need at least a 2-1 in an applied experimental science, and we've looked at what that means. But what about international applicants? So by my counting on one of these FOIs, there were 17 international applicants that were shortlisted for interview in 2020. Now, I actually think this is quite significant. Um, as you know, I peruse these lists uh, in my spare time, and I haven't seen that many instances where graduate medicine courses are admitting uh, international applicants. I have come across some successful applications uh, from international students to, for example, King's College London, but again, it was only kind of five or six. Oxford has definitely got the most successful international applicants to graduate medicine uh, of all the courses that I've researched anyway. So although there were 17 people shortlisted for interview, it looks like there were five uh, international applicants that made it through to an offer. And out of these five, the lowest GPA held was at 3.8 and that was in health science with a concentration in microbiology. The other degree types accepted were things like biomedical engineering, neuroscience, um, Bachelor of Arts chemistry, uh, well, I don't know what that is, and public health. But yeah, all of them had kind of high three point something GPAs. To be fair, I don't know what that means. Um, but So if you hold a relevant degree in applied experimental science and you've got at least a 2-1 in this, um, or a GPA 3.85, and your A-levels are up to the minimum standards, then you should apply via UCAS and you should submit this supplementary uh, Oxford application form. But this is something that I've heard that Oxbridge do. They, they just make you work that tiny bit harder. I looked on the student room for someone uh, talking about this, and what they said was that it was mainly giving the contact details of referees, answering some questions about experiences you've had. There is also space for you to include an Oxford-directed personal statement outlining why you want to apply there, but that that was optional. So make of that what you will. You then need to think about the entrance exam. An Oxford graduate entry medicine use a test called the biomedical admissions test or the BMAT. You've got to register for this test at the end of September and then you take it in October. So this is a two hour test that has three sections in it and, and it's a test that I personally didn't take. So once again, I looked at the student room to try and find some uh, personalized advice and how they prepared for the BMAT was by doing two weeks using the Medify question banks for two hours a day on weekdays because they were working in a lab and then four hours on weekends. They also recommend keeping the essay in section three short uh, and, and reading the Medify tips for that, that section as well. So exactly what score do you need to aim for when you're trying to take this test and when you're preparing for this test? The Jay Levy request reveals that in 2019, the lowest overall score was candidate nine here. Um, and they achieved a total of 13.5. That was the lowest score in total. The lowest in section one was five. The lowest in section two was 4.3 and the lowest in section three was three. So once you've achieved all the things that I've said, you've banged out your two weeks of Medify practice, you know, two hours a night on weekdays, four hours on weekends, uh, doing the timed questions. You've read your essay tips for section three of the BMAT. Then you're probably going to be invited to an interview. And once you are walking through the gates of Oxford University to do your graduate an interview, you have a very, very good chance of getting in. You know, in 2020, they interviewed 80 people and gave out 38 offers. You know, you're walking in with another prospective graduate medicine uh, a student and you think one of us is probably getting in. That's, that's a really, really good chance, um, better than a lot of other places, to be honest. So Oxford's website says that you'll be interviewed by two separate colleges and perusing the student room, it looks like you have two interviews at two colleges. Um, so doing the quick maths, that seems like four interviews, I reckon. These are going to be panel interviews where you're sat across from your interviewer. Once again, here are some personal tips I've extracted from the student room. They recommend reading up on some topics of medical interest before the interview. I'd probably talk about the ever-expanding use of artificial intelligence uh, in healthcare. They advocate finding some Oxbridge-style interview questions online and trying to answer them. You know, literally probably saying them out loud to someone and trying to get some feedback. If you can reach out to someone that has gone to Oxford or Cambridge um, and get them to listen to you answering their questions, they'll have a lot more experience um, in the kind of small tutorial groups, which are the way they like to structure their interviews from, from what I've heard. So get them to listen to your answers and give you some feedback on, on how you're performing. That's probably what I'd do. Anyway, they advocate practicing interpreting data and figures in scientific papers because they like to ask about that. They reckon once you're in the interview itself, just stay relaxed 
be enthusiastic and just happy to be there. And when you're asked a question, just think out loud, you know, verbalize your thought process. Um, that's gonna show you that your, your thought has, has a clear form to it. You know, you have a structured way of, of attacking problems. So it sounds like they will let you know if you have an interview by the end of November. They hold these interviews sometime in December and offers are received in January. So if I were to summarize what I've said so far, Oxford run a small to medium sized graduate program. The bespoke portion of their course lasts two years before you rejoin the standard program in its fifth year. You're gonna need specific A-levels and at least a 2-1 in applied experimental science. You'll also need to take the BMAT and attend a panel interview where you'll now have a sensational chance of success one in two. And if you're successful, you'll probably find out sometime at the start of the new year. Thank you very much for watching. I hope this was reasonably useful and hopefully see you in the next one. Cheers.